Yes, I am. All right. Okay. Your design is due soon. I forget what day exactly. Wednesday. Wednesday? Okay, fair enough. Um, I'll do my best, or Thursday. <laughs> I'll do my best to get it graded, uh, to do a quick turnaround on the grading so that you have a chance to make any revisions that, that will improve your project. Um, let me sketch out. Obviously, getting, getting the project done is, is a big part of the last section of this class. So by all means, if you have questions, please bring them to class, either about the design or about the actual creation of the project. So that's sort of going to be a, a very important piece. The other things that we will consider, we have about three other main topics to consider in about five weeks, four weeks? This is week 11, right? 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, five weeks. So um, we have our project to get done. That's one big thing. We have HTML forms, which we're going to start today. We have HTML tables. And then we're going to have an introduction to JavaScript. Um, just enough to give you a sense of how it fits into the picture. Um, we're not going to make you a JavaScript expert, but um, JavaScript is the one client-side technology, standard technology, that we really haven't talked about in this class. And um, as such, we, we want to at least complete the picture, even if we don't make you an expert in it. Um, but now on to HTML forms. What do I mean by HTML forms? Well, it's something that the user can enter input in. You can look on, on many of the, the, the biggest, most popular web pages. You'll see one form or another. Let's go to Google, which is an example of almost anything that you can think of in terms of web technologies. But if I go to Google, I want you to think about a couple of things. All right, there it is. There is a, it's called a text box. It allows us to enter in a single line of text. There's two buttons underneath it, even though they may not look like buttons on the screen to you. Those actually are uh, buttons. And I can type something in there and get my search results for that thing. It's, it's something that, you know, we do so often we might take it for granted. But let's step back and reflect upon this a bit. All right. Because, let's say, for example, I type in Italian restaurants. Let's say I'm planning on taking my family out to eat this weekend. Italian restaurants, okay, they have the yellow page listing for Illyria Italian restaurants, Yahoo listing, TripAdvisor, Johnny Carino's, never heard of that. Illyria Restaurants on Urban Spoon, The Olive Garden, Nino's Restaurant in Illyria, and so on down the line. Okay. Well, maybe I don't want Italian food. Maybe I want Mexican. Illyria Mexican Restaurants, El Patron, Illyria, Ohio, Mezcal, Illyria, Ohio. And so down the line. Let's say I want French restaurants. I'm trying to think of famous cuisines. Oops. All right. Ten best French restaurants in Paris. Okay. Chez Francois. And so on down the line. Indian restaurants. Cafe Tandoor, which is in Westlake. And so on down the line. Now, a couple things we should notice by doing this. First of all, 
In thinking on how we've done web pages so far, it should be clear that something else is going on here, right? Because if we carry this to the extreme, if I were to type in Korean restaurants, Japanese restaurants, Chinese restaurants, I'd get a page geared towards exactly what I typed in. Now if we think about it, it doesn't make sense that there would be sitting out a, in, in Google land a web page for every possible thing that I could type in, right? Because we're just doing restaurants now. It could be anything. I could type in, you know, hotels, photography shops, um, men's clothing stores, you know, any, ki any kind of thing like that. It's absurd to think that there is a web page sitting out there for every possible thing that I could type in. So obviously something else is going on there. The other thing that is interesting is that at least for the first couple, um, what were the first couple I typed in? Oh, Italian and Mexican, where there's kind of a lot of them in this area, all right? Most of the results were geared towards this area, you know? That means one of two things. Either we are fortunate that all the best restaurants in the world are located in Illyria, all right? That's one possibility. Or, probably the more likely person, uh, possibility, something else is going on behind the scenes that knows where we are and gears our results for us specifically. So for example, I doubt if someone was in Rome, if they Googled Italian restaurants, that they'd get a restaurant in Illyria. I would doubt if you were in New York City and you Googled Italian restaurants that you'd get a restaurant in Illyria and so on. So what's going on? is server-side scripting. And it's important to have an overview of server-side scripting before we talk about forms. All right. Um, if I can draw a diagram, I've probably drawn before in class, and I draw it in all my classes. I've jokingly said I should get this tattooed in my arm just so I could point to it and not have to go and draw it each time, but they'd probably go and change something and I'd have to get it revised. We have our client, which is someone surfing the web. Could be on a desktop computer or it could be on a mobile device. We have the internet, which is a, a way of connecting computers together. It's drawn as a cloud because, well, we don't really need to know exactly what goes on in there for the purposes of this class. We know that if I make a request for www.cnn.com, that somehow it makes it to that web server. In this class, we don't care about the details of how that works. All right, so it's drawn as a cloud. And on the other end, you have the web servers, and web servers are where the web pages live. So, for example, if any of your projects that you've completed you know, you can run them on your machine, but if you wanted them available to the world, you'd have to put them on a web server that was connected, connected to the internet, uh, that had a, a, an address associated with it, and people would type in the address of your page, it would find your server, and it would deliver the pages that you've created for this class. All right? Yes? Speaking of that, Oh, no, no. Strictly speaking, I said you had to have an address where you type in. And, and strictly speaking, that's not, that's not correct. You can, you can access a web page via an IP address. Okay, so, so, so if I'm happy to be able to access my web server at my apartment, yes. I can set up a web server just based on my IP address without having a... Uh, yes. Yeah, you, don't, you don't need a domain name registered. Uh, typically you will if you're doing a business because you don't want people having to memorize long numbers, but uh, it just really needs to be connected to the internet. In fact, you know, um, you know, I've had people test out stuff that way before they're ready to go live. They'll just give their IP address and, yeah, and, and do that. All right. Now, the case of the pages that we've had so far in class, if you were to open up the page that you did for the first week of class today and, and run it again, your output would look identical to when you turned it in. 
If you're going to change it, if you want to change it, you'd have to manually go in and change the code, you know, and add something, get rid of something, whatever. Pages like that are called static pages. Static means unchanging. All right. Think of ordering a burger at McDonald's, right? If you go into McDonald's and order a burger or order a chicken sandwich or order anything like that, there's a bin of them in the back. The server just turns, grabs one, and gives it to you. All right? And you'll get the same kind of chicken sandwich as anyone else will. All right? They just make a bunch of them. They have them sitting out there waiting for you. And the server's job is simply to deliver what has been created in advance. Compare that to Subway. All right? If you go to Subway, you go in there, you order the sandwich that you want, but you're not done there, right? And in Subway, they don't have a bin full of every kind of sandwich that you could possibly order. Why? Because the combinations are, there's a crazy number of combinations. You could get a turkey sandwich uh, with lettuce, a turkey sandwich with no lettuce but spinach, a turkey sandwich with no lettuce or spinach but tomato and onions, and so on. The permutations are astronomical. They couldn't possibly have every sandwich that you could possibly order sitting in a bin and go and find the bin and give it to you. So what do they do? They make it on the fly. They have a recipe in their head, like what normally goes on to a turkey club sandwich, for example. Then they ask you some pieces of information, like do you want lettuce on it? Do you want tomatoes on it? Do you want any kind of dressing? Do you want it toasted? Do you want cheese? And so on. And they assemble on the fly a sandwich built to your specifications. All right. That's almost like what happens here between dynamic web pages and server-side scripting. Dyna or static web pages um, are like McDonald's. That is, you've created the pages, you've stuck them out there on a web server, people ask for them and they simply get delivered. No processing needs to be done. The, the web pages are in their final form. All they have to do is be sent to the, the, to the client that requests them. Now, that works for certain kinds of content, content that doesn't change that often. You know, if you simply had a, a simple web page that t talked about, you know, where a company was located and how to contact them and maybe an overview of their services, a static website might be adequate for that. But for anything that's more involved, we typically use dynamic web pages and we use server-side scripting. All right. And Google, again, is the classic example. It would be absurd to think to ha of having a web page for every single possible thing that people could search for. I mean, it doesn't even make sense to think about that. Then what if something new is invented? All right, Someone would have to go out. And, what if new websites are added or old websites are deleted? It's absurd to think about it in those terms, just like it's absurd to think of Subway having a bin of every combination of sub sandwich you can order. So instead, what server-side scripting does is it has, the servers have recipes for web pages. Of course, they're not called recipes, they're called scripts. And these scripts are written in any number of different languages. They could be written in ASP.NET slash C Sharp. They could be written in PHP, they could be written in Perl, they could be written in Python, they could be written in a variety of different languages. All right? And what those scripts do is, again, they're recipe for a web page. And when someone makes a request for a web page, just like when I do a Google for Italian restaurants, I go to the Google script, which is a bunch of instructions. It takes a bunch of parameters, like, for example, what I Googled for. It takes my IP address, which gives some indication of where I'm probably at, all right? And it takes other factors and uses that along with Google's database of every website in the world to come up with a page made just for me. Um, 
I was reading somewhere, and I'm sure, again, this has changed and evolved, but they, they, they said something like 35 factors go into a, a, a Google search, including stuff that you searched for before. All right. So, for example, uh, if you did a lot of searches for gluten-free stuff, gluten-free restaurants might appear higher on your search results or restaurants that feature gluten-free items might appear higher than it would for someone that hadn't done searches like that. Okay, so now you might ask yourself, why did I spend 10 weeks learning HTML if now this guy is going to tell me that these dynamic web pages are written in PHP or ASP.NET or whatever? Well, keep in mind that these are pages that create HTML. And when you write a PHP page, you're writing a page that outputs HTML. So you need to know how to write HTML yourself in order to write a script. In reality, these server-side scripts are a mix of plain old HTML and some other kind of scripting stuff that accomplishes the dynamic stuff. So you didn't waste your time learning HTML. You'll use it as you create server-side scripting pages. All right. Now... Some of the factors that influence what's in the web page sort of are not important to us in this class. For example, the IP address automatically goes when you make a request. All right? There's nothing we have to do to make that happen. Um, database interactivity, well, that, that's covered in another class. We, you know, we, we don't really cover that in this class. But we do cover forms, and forms are what give the server, some of the options, some of the parameters that we're searching for, all right, that they come via the form. All right, so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about not the server-side scripting part of it, so we only unfortunately get half the story done. All right, the half of the story that we do is we figure out how to collect the data and send it to the server. In other classes, we study what the server does with that stuff and processes it uh, to output it. So, we saw in our Google example a couple things that are on forms. We saw a text box and we saw buttons. All right, those are two things that are on a lot of forms. All right. Buttons are on the form to actually send the data to the server. So, in other words, when we press the button, it's said to submit the form. And this action happens. The request gets sent to the server and includes everything that was on the form, the IP address, the server that we're trying to access, the page that we're trying to access, and even stuff like what our platform is. Am I running a Mac versus a PC? Am I running an iPhone or an Android device? All that stuff goes as part of the request, too, so that the server can customize a page. If you notice, for example, if you go to a download page, and it might be more apparent to someone that runs a Mac, but if you go to a download page, for example, uh, oftentimes, like, the Mac, like when I use my Mac to go to a page to download something, the Mac version will be sort of highlighted. I'll go there for, by default, because it knows I have a Mac. Why give me the Windows page, right? Again, another case of the server taking something it knows about the request and formatting the page specifically for it. All right, so, so far we have text boxes. Which represents a single line of text. We have a submit button, which... sends the request to the server. What are some other things that we have on forms besides these two things? Sign in. Okay, sign in. Let's click that and see what happens. Really this, we just get a text box, a text box, and a button again. So I'm talking about those individual form elements. There is a new one on this page. This guy, a checkbox. Okay, radio buttons. Let's put these down, and then we can 
we can um, analyze them in more detail later. What, what else? A drop down list. What else? There's actually several more. There is a text area. which is multiple lines of text. There is a password control where it doesn't echo the character back. So as you're typing in, um, it uh, doesn't display it. It displays a dot or an asterisk or something. There's a plain old button There is a reset button. And then there's a whole bunch of new HTML5 controls. We're going to focus on each one of these. And it's important when you're designing a form to think about what's the best choice for a form element. All right? So let's go down here. Text box is a single line of text. What are, kind of, what are some of the things that this would be appropriate for? Yeah, name. Email address. Phone number. Single line of text. So not paragraphs of text, but a single line of text. Submit button. Just about every form is going to have one of these, because that's actually what sends it to the server. A checkbox. What do you do with checkboxes? Stay, yeah, stay sign in. Remember password. All right. In essence, yes or no questions. All right. So a checkbox has two options. It's either checked or it's not checked. All right. So therefore, it represents yes or no questions pretty well. Do you agree with the terms and conditions is a popular one. Right? And that, that needs to be checked. What about a radio button? What's the difference between a radio button and a checkbox? Right. A checkbox, the each checkbox is independent. So if I had three checkboxes, I could make all three of them checked, all three of them unchecked, check two and not the third in any combination. With radio buttons, when they're grouped together, all right. The choices are mutually exclusive. So, for example, I could have select what kind of phone you use. Um, Android, iPhone, Windows Phone, or other. I could have four selections. All right. If I use radio buttons for them, then those four choices would be mutually exclusive. All right, so if I checked Android, it would uncheck iPhone. If I checked Android, then checked iPhone, it would uncheck iPhone and check Android or whatever I said. All right, only one of them, though, only one of them at a time. Now, part of your job as a form designer and as a web designer is deciding what is appropriate. For example, there are people, there might be people, let me, let me put it that way, they have more than one phone. All right. So, would it be better to have a checkbox or a radio button for the phone? It all depends really on what you do, what you do, and you should be careful. Maybe you'd say something like, you know, the phone that you, you know your primary phone for business purposes or your primary phone for personal purposes, what kind it is. Then you'd use a radio button. Or if you said check all the phones that you use then it would be checkboxes. So you have to decide what you want. Now, why not just, why not just do everything with text boxes? In other words, why, why even monkey around with these? Instead of having radio buttons or checkboxes for the kind of phone, just have a text box and say, type in the kind of phone that you have. People aren't going to do that. Because people aren't going to do that? That's one possibility. What will people do instead? 
Just skip it? Yeah. Well, okay. It's easier to check a box than typing in the name. So, yeah, you're, you're right in that regard. Oh. Yeah, I, 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 I assumed you were, but I still have to pause on that one. Yeah, go ahead. Exactly. For example, um, if I just want to know, do people have more Apple or Androids, right? If I gave a text box, one person could type in Apple, another person could type in iPhone, another person could type in iPhone, iPhone 5, another person could misspell it, maybe, and put a space between I and phone, all right? Uh, and, and, and so on down the line, all right? So if I want to restrict people to only choosing certain options for consistency purposes or because I want to tie it to a database maybe, all right, then I'm going to want to restrict them by having radio buttons or check boxes or something as opposed to a text box. Whereas something with name or email address, it's absurd to talk about a list of all the possible names so someone just had to check the name that they belong, right? I mean, it doesn't even make sense to think about it those ways. Um, so therefore, if you want to limit people to only picking certain selections, then you probably would use a checkbox or a radio button. What about a droplet, drop down list? Where does that fit in? Yeah, list of options where we can choose. How is it different than radio buttons? Okay, it is possible to sort of chain dro uh, drop downs together, whereas you pick one item from one list, it'll give you then a second set of options. So you, you could do that. You actually could do that with radio buttons as well, but, um, you, you know, that, that is one possibility. But what is different? Let's, let's, let me put it this way. Both uh, radio buttons and a drop down limit you to selecting one from a list of options. What's the difference then between the two if they both do that? Right. It is largely a matter of real estate. So, for example, if I was going to do the 50 states, all right. 50 states with radio buttons probably wouldn't look very good. It would take up a lot of space on the screen and, and it would be difficult. A drop down probably would be a much more better, more concise way to list um, 50 states. So it largely becomes a real estate issue. Now, for some, in some cases, we have options. If I had a yes or no question, I could do it with a checkbox. I could do it with a radio button. Or I could do it with a drop down. I might not do it with a checkbox because someone's liable to just ignore it and not do anything. But with a drop down, I could force them to pick one. All right? I could force them to pick yes or no, or I could force them to pick between two radio buttons. All right? All these things come into play. By the way, one thing that's not real commonly done, but you actually can do it, is that with a drop down you can allow people to make more than one selection. All right? It's not real common, but you can do that. So in that regard, uh, a, a drop down in a way can sort of act like a set of check boxes or like a set of radio buttons. Text area is for multiple lines of stuff. So if you had comments. You know, if you wanted someone to be able to type in comments or you had a contact us form, all right, and you, um, you know, said, you know, put your remarks here. You probably would want that to be a text area, all right. That way they could type in multiple lines of comments, all right. A password is pretty obvious, right. Enter a password for security reasons. It doesn't echo that. The rest of these controls we're going to save for another day. All right. Okay. 
So let's look at a simple form. And in order to really do this, I'm going to have to wire my form to a server-side script. Well, we don't talk about server-side scripts too much in this class, so we're going to have to borrow one. All right. Well, who to borrow from? Who better to borrow from than someone that has a lot of money? All right. You're going to borrow from someone. Borrow from someone that has a lot of money. Don't borrow from someone that doesn't have any money. It's not a good idea. So we're going to borrow a form, or we're going to borrow a server-side script from Microsoft. We're going to borrow. Um, their Bing search engine script. All right. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a form that calls their server-side script to do a search. And it's okay I'm doing this. It's not like I'm, you know, uh, hacking them or anything like that. They, they allow, they even encourage you to do things like this to use their, because it's using their product. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a text box, a submit button on a form, and I'm going to wire that form to the Bing search engine. So let's start out here. And Bing looks like this. And if I typed in something like What should I type in? Italian restaurants. All right. Works very similar to Google in the sense that it shows me Italian restaurants are in the area. All right, let's go and let's create a new HTML document. Excuse me. Time change. I don't know why, but when the time changes in the spring and when the time changes in the fall, I'm sleepy the next day. <laughs> Should it be one of the one of the two of them wide awake or alert? But it doesn't work that way. So we'll put our doc type in here. All right. The first tag that we're going to look at is the form tag. And think of the form tag as being like a envelope that's going to wrap around everything that we're sending up to the server. All right, you know, you send uh, someone something not that you just have one sheet of paper in there, right? You could you could put several sheets of paper, or you know you could put, you know, when I get my bills, for example, I'll get you know the bill that I need to send in. I'll get like an explanation of the bill. I'll get an advertisement for something from the company, and I'll get so there's a bunch of things that are packaged all in in an envelope, and they all go together, and that's what they have in common. They all came together to me as as a package. The form tag does an analogous thing, right? This is everything that we're going to send to the server in one shot, all right? Now, in this case, in this example, we're only sending one thing to the server, all right? So it's, it's pretty simple, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an envelope with just like one thing, you know, with one sheet of paper in it. But don't be confused or, or don't misunderstand and think that if you had more than one thing, you'd have more than one form tag. You don't. The form tag represents one chunk of data that you're going to send to the server. Now, it's possible on a given page you could have two form tags. For example, on some pages there's a fill in this to register an account 
fill in this to log into your account. Those are two different forms because you're sending two different chunks of data to the server. One time you're sending in, assuming you're already a customer of theirs, and the other time you're filling in and creating a new account. All right. But, again, it's not like one field per form tag. You can put a bunch of form tags, a bunch of fields inside a form tag. This form tag has two attributes. an action and a method. The method we're going to wait on for a while. And I'm just going to use one of the methods. There's two choices for the method. And one of them is get. And we'll come back to the other one in a minute. The action is the name of the script that I want to call. And in this case, it's typically going to be everything prior to the question mark. All right. So, oops. the script I want to call is on the Bing server, so http colon slash slash www.bing.com slash search. And the way I got it is the name of the script is everything before the question mark. Now, when you're writing your own stuff, you're going to be the person that's responsible or your team is going to be responsible for creating the HTML page and creating the script. So you'll know it because either you're making that page, so you know, hey, what, what, what am I going to call that page? Okay, I'll call it search or whatever. Or someone else in your team, like if you're working on a larger project and, and a couple people are involved, you just turn to the person next to you that's working on this and say, what are you going to call that page? Oh, you're going to call it that? Okay, good to go. In our case, we have to look at the URL up there to determine it. Now, I'm going to put the text box and the submit button here. Input type equals text is for a text box. Name equals Q. How did I know name equals Q? Well, I did a little reverse engineering. And if you notice, after the question mark on the URL, there's Q equals, and then after the equal sign is what I actually put in the search box. So because I'm familiar with forms, that's telling me I have to call this text box Q. Because Q is the name that the server is expecting for the term that I'm searching for. All right. Again, if you were doing this yourself, you'd know, well, this is what you'd come up with. Gee, this is what I'm going to call this field. Or you'd ask the person on your team that's responsible for that. But here I have to sort of look at the query string and reverse engineer it. So, input type equals text, name equals Q, input type equals submit, Value equals search Bing. All right. Now, not every one of these form, control, uh, form controls are a input tag, but some of them are. All right. So that's a little confusing, but keep in mind, I didn't make this up, so don't blame me. Text boxes and submit buttons, though, are both done with input tags, um, one of which type equals text is for a text box, type equals submit is for a submit button. How do you specifically input type? Oh, there's a list of hard-coded values. In other words, I didn't make up the type. If we like do a search
for HTML input types, we'll see a list of the things that you can get. Many of these are HTML5 stuff, but here we see a list of some of the things that we had. Type equals text, type equals submit, type equals radio, type equals password, type equals date time, type equals color, and so on down the line. That's just going to be the label on the button. So that, that's the text on the button. So that's whatever I want. On the button that we're creating. On the button that we're creating. Okay. Right. Both these things, what we're doing here is we're creating a form. And a form consists of two things. It consists of a text box followed by a submit button. So let's go and run this. I'm going to go and I'm going to save this as... form.html on the desktop. There's our text box. There's our submit button. Submit button is labeled by search Bing. And if I type something in here, and click search, we're taken to Bing's page, and it does the search for Italian restaurants. You know, the, the answer to the question, is there a way, is almost always yes. All right, there, there's a way to do almost, almost anything. Uh, there, there's a few ways that we could do this, uh, but they're all a lot more involved. Um, for our purposes here, it's important for us to show how um, we're taking our HTML stuff and sending it over there. When you write your own server-side scripts, all right, um, then that's, that's not really an issue because it's staying on your own site and, and, and everything's okay. When you do this, for now, while there may be ways to, to make it look more like it's incorporated in your page, this pretty much is, is, is the way I want to demonstrate now. It's the most straightforward way. And it's a way, I think, that makes clear the fact that we're sending this to a server to be processed. Now, let's dissect the URL, all right, when I click search. HTTP Bing slash search. HTTP Bing.com slash search. Where did that come from in our code? That was the action of the form. So, you could ask the question, why did my page call that page? Well, part of this is from the action of the form. You notice that this matches, the action of the form matches the URL that got called. What about the rest of the stuff? The question mark just gets put there automatically. The Q equals comes from the fact that I called the name of that text box Q. Why did I call it Q? Because I looked at a Bing search and I found out that's what it was expecting. So I better match what it's expecting. And then finally, the string that's after it is 
the string I actually typed in the text box for the search. Which is no different than if I just went to Bing right off and did a search. I won't say no different. Let me, let me rephrase that. It's not much different. There's a few extra things on this. But you know what? They're optional. If you don't have them on there, it doesn't really make much of a difference. The important one for a search is the queue, the query, the thing specifically that we're looking for. This is the mechanism of forms. In other words, this is the process. We have a form that consists of an envelope around all the things we're going to send to the server. All right. We fill that in, we press submit. The script that we name as the action gets called. And on the query string, provided we use a method of get, each of these names get put along with the appropriate values from the form control, the text box or whatever. Now, Wednesday and possibly Monday of next week we'll finish this up. All right. What are we going to do to finish it up? Well, we're going to try to make these look better. All right. right now it's just the text box sitting there with a the button next to it. So we'll try to do some styling. We'll make it more accessible. And we'll talk about, uh, we, we talked about accessibility last week, and we'll talk about uh, the accessibility implications of forms uh, in future, future days. Then we'll start to look at how these other form controls work. All right? In other words, radio buttons and drop downs and all those sorts of things. We'll see how they work. And then, then we'll, we'll move on. All right, questions? No, it, not, not all of them are input tags. For example, a drop down is a select tag. A radio button is an input tag. A checkbox is an input tag. A text area is a text area tag. Again, there, there seems, I'm sure there's a good reason for it, but it's not really immediately apparent why some of them are input tags and some of them aren't. All right. Other questions? All right. See you in lab. <laughs>